Okay, welcome to another episode of the Data Standard Podcast Experience. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's, it's great to have Rodrigo Senra, and Rodrigo is the Group Technology Director at Work and & Company, Work & Co. Rodrigo, we're, we're so happy to have you. You've got a ton of background, a ton of experience in the, the data science space. So why don't we just, to, to kind of introduce yourself, talk about kind of your background and how you came to uh, Work & Co. Sure, that's a great start. So I have a background in computer science since the beginning. I went to do computer engineering as my main uh, uh, undergraduate course. And then I continue uh, the academical career in parallel to an industry career. I, I was lucky enough for my first job to be able to negotiate to continue doing my studies in parallel. So I accumulate both experiences at the same time. Okay. So it's just kind of heavy, but I did my master thesis in computational reflection and then a PhD in databases and information systems. But uh, at the same time, I was working uh, in the industry and I changed fields a lot. I worked with like device drivers, then industrial automation, then semantic web. Uh, and then around 2014, 2016, I found myself working for EMC right before it was bought from Dell. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I was, I was working in a research center focused on exploring uh, oil and gas because Brazil has just like figured out like a major uh, oil reserves. Uh, they were deep in the ocean, so it would be hard to extract all that oil. Uh, but at the same time, there was like a major political crisis in the country. And then that kind of research became difficult to pursue. And our research center started to attack multiple other tracks. And all my colleagues, uh, data scientists, grouped with like the sales team. And we were starting to do work for Televisa in Mexico, trying to optimize soup operas, just like Netflix did with House of Cards. Yeah. How can you create the perfect soup opera? <laughs> uh, or for Telcel, also in Mexico, how do you create, how do you diagnose failures in uh, network telephones based on sentiment analysis for tweets? So mm -hmm. these kind of random projects became more and more common, which were great to sharpen our uh, data science skills. After two years in that space, working cool, at the time already successful, but it's still growing invited me to leave Brazil and join their office in Brooklyn, New York. And I, I accepted it, it. And since then, I'm with Working Co. Okay. And uh, we have lots of challenges, data challenges at Working Co. And I'm pushing strongly towards something I call data-driven design, which is trying to bring all the hype and the skills and the knowledge from the data science world into the design space okay. for mobile apps, web apps, digital products in, in general. So tell the, the community a little bit about um, Work & Co. What, is, what type of projects does the company do? What, what kind of business is it? Awesome. So Work & Co. Uh, defines itself as a digital products company. You can understand that as a mixture of a traditional agency, a design agency, mm -hmm. plus uh, offering services for projects management and strategy, Plus, and here comes the innovation part, technology. So we do have in our staff, front-end developers, back-end developers, data scientists, QA staff, QA engineers, automation, DevOps. So we have all the tech army that is needed to make sure we can implement our designs to the ladder. So okay. be really faithful to the vision that we have created for our clients. And that was a major struggle for many other clients for agencies because they bought a design, but then they had to find out somebody to implement that design. And we are delivering those digital products turnkey. So that, that is our business model. Are you typically embedded inside of an enterprise or do you do, you do the work outside and then give it to them and they plug it in? How does that? Oh, it's a, it's a very, um, a partnership. It's a very close by. I wouldn't go as far as calling embedded, especially in our remote world. Mm -hmm. Those frontiers are so blurry. Sure, uh, sure. But for sure, to give the concrete example, I'm working right now with uh, Gatorade 
for a product called GX. And we've been working with them for almost two years now, okay. uh, just for that particular project. And I'm working exclusively, uh, or I would say exclusively is too strong, but uh, 90% of my time is dedicated to that one project. So okay. it's really close partnership. So talk about the Gatorade project. What is, uh, what, what's the challenge there as much as you can kind of share? Of course, the Gatorade uh, project that we, we did a bunch of things for Gatorade, uh, for their website, for another application called Highlights. But the one I'm talking about is called um, GX. Internally, we call the GX Consumer. We also have a second application called GX Teams, but both of them are leveraging an innovation uh, device that they are uh, launching for high performance athletes and also athletes in general, which is the sweat patch. Our listen, I will describe for our listeners so they can understand what the sweat patch is, but it's basically a sticker with two channels. The, that sticker you put in your forearm mm -hmm. and then it will capture your sweat during workout exercise from two tiny little dots. Mm -hmm. And then it will fill those two channels, one of them will get like orange, like a snake zigzagging all the way through the sticker. The other one will change color. Uh, the orange channel will give us the volume of sweat you have produced during that particular workout. It can be running, bike, weightlifting, what yeah. have you. Yeah. And the other channel, the color channel, will change color accordingly to the amount of sodium that you have lost in your sweat why those two things are important. So hydration is critical for health in general, sure. let alone high performance competitions. So the idea there is to give you an idea of how can you properly hydrate before, during and after exercise. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple ways you can do that. One of them is like way out. So you measure your weights and then you have a sense of how much weight you lost. But for the electrolytes, for measuring how much sodium loss, that is like unique. Yeah. And given that concentration of sodium, we can give you electrolytes recommendations so you can replenish your electrolytes loss. Got it. And that speaks to your muscles, which speaks to your performance. So, so that was, go ahead. That actual patch is something that you all designed or you're designing more? No, 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 no. Yeah, that's a great question. So that is a collaboration. There are many companies involved. Yep. So Working Co was, uh, so I'll say, summoned to help them with developing the mobile app. And within uh, the process of developing the mobile app, we realized the opportunity to develop the whole digital platform. So we end up developing two APIs, they are database models, mathematical models in partnership with the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. But the patch was created by another company called Epicor, which okay. is a company specialized in uh, those medical devices or bio-inspired yeah. uh, uh, computing and devices as well. Is there an IoT component to that or does that patch plug into some sort of um, hardware device? Excellent question. In, uh, there's something on the lines in the future, but it's still kind of secret. This patch, it doesn't. So the patch is purely physical. Yep. The way we capture the information, and here comes the data part, uh, we use machine learning techniques to capture an image of the patch. And through the image of the patch, we segment wow. and then we process and identify the sodium concentration and volume of sodium loss based on the image. Wow. Okay. That's, that's fascinating. That's very interesting. Okay. Okay. And tell, tell me, I know you've got a couple other ones that you've been working on. One with CBS, Give With. I'd love to hear a little bit about that one too. Oh, sure. Uh, Give With was a very interesting project. I was, it's, it's still active. I was engaged around, I would say 2018 or so. And uh, there were like two projects. We started our engagement with Give With trying to solve a very mundane and, and common problem for brands. They usually are running uh, campaigns, maybe on Facebook, maybe on Google. So you have like videos, you have banners. Yeah. And each of these platforms, they have their own analytics metric system. Mm -hmm. And how do you consolidate all of those campaigns into a single consistent view. So that was our uh, first engagement with GiveWith. So we are creating that specialized CMS 
where they could create those campaigns. And we were a mediator from that definition to the actual uh, brands that the actual services that were running those campaigns. Yeah. And then we were re-ingesting the information, breaking up the data into a granularity and a frequency that made sense to be regrouped and aggregated back again in a consolidated view cross service. So yeah. then they could see Google results, Facebook results, ad forms results, Qual Qualtrics surveys, all with the same dashboard. And nowadays you do have companies specialized just to do that sort of thing. But at the time they wanted that very customized. So we developed a system just for that. And that led to the, the Segway project, which was called Give With Commerce. And the idea, and it was an insight from the CEO of the company, which was, okay, while two brands are making business, could uh -huh. we create some incentives for that negotiation, generate a sponsoring for a program from a nonprofit organization? So we are stimulating people to be sponsoring those nonprofits uh, programs. And based on that idea, that was the data challenge so how can we create the mechanics to make that happen? And we created a matchmaking API that looks to big brands from the one side and looks to programs from nonprofits on the other side mm -hmm. and try to do the matchmaking saying, if you are Dell, IBM, Microsoft, Google, Apple, which of these programs will produce the desired increase in your goodwill, in your public image, on Completely. the fields of maybe government or social or environmental. So that was the magic. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about Phil's Coffee because there's another one I've got on my list here that you, you've you done sure. some interesting work with. Sure. And Phil's was my first uh, engagement uh, when I joined Working Co. at 2016. So uh, Jacob, the, the CEO of Phil's at the time, and um, also other people came to us from the company with a big problem proposal. And the problem was the brand is going national. We are aggressively ex expanding, but it, we are already a success in the West Coast. Yeah. But we have a critical problem. We have two long lines. So you have these giant lines, the people are kind of piling up on the streets to get our coffee. It's a nice, great problem to have, but how can we make it better? Wow. So that was like the first problem proposition. The second one was that they were adopting a white label mobile app to do mobile orders. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to do something more on brand, customized. And we decided to tackle the two problems at once. Okay. So the mobile app became the solution for the long lines. And the idea that we came up with was how about, and because we are a mixture of designers and software engineers, we tackled it as a computing problem. So in a computing problem, you do load balancing all the time. You have servers, they are stressed, you distribute the loads. So yeah. if you have stores and they are stressed, why not distribute the loads across other stores? And that's specifically viable when you have cities like, for example, San Francisco, where you have multiple stores that are nearby. So mm -hmm. if you give information to customers to make better educated decisions about, should I go buy my coffee here on the corner or walk more five minutes and, and, and get no lines, that's much better. So that was the idea. In addition to reserve the time of the barista, like you schedule an appointment with your doctor. So mm -hmm. you never have lines, at, at least hopefully, you don't have like two long lines when you go to your PCP because you scheduled that appointment. Yeah. So you have some control of the load. And that was the same idea we conveyed for fields. So can you actually go on the app today and see like, you know, wait time at one store is, you know, 10 minutes, another one is 15 or something like that? Yes, you can change stores. And when you change stores, you see the next time where you can schedule to pick up your coffee is still hot. How do you kind of gather the data that says, let's say that ah, store A is 10 that minutes, is 10 the minute question. wait? So we, we began that journey first mm -hmm. checking if that was a viable solution. So 
we wanted to validate that. And that's where it comes, the data-driven design that I mentioned you in the beginning. Yeah. So at the time, we had the luck that they had data from that white label application. So they had like eight months of data. Mm -hmm. So instead of starting a uh, design concept team, right from the start, we did maybe a week of data exploration to understand, even though in a different app, what was the behavior of those users. Yeah. And from that aspect, we, we could steer design a little bit. There were like big challenges. There were like traditional based on integrating systems. For example, they do not have baristas on their payroll. They have another system called Legion where they get freelance baristas sometime to accommodate the extra load. And for that, we need to integrate with that other system to be able to provision the capacity of a store. Yeah. To understand with the help of people from Phil's that had that metric internally, how fast is a barista on average to make a product? So based on that data, we could create a simulator and see if that would work. And based on the simulator, we create a reservation system that is a to discretize the time of the barista. And then we could schedule those appointments for your uh, coffee. Yeah, okay. T tell me a little bit about kind of, because because some of the stuff you're talking about, a lot of it has to do with distributed, you know, distributed systems and data kind of at the edge. So, right. you know, how do you see, I'd, I'd love to just get your perspective on like where distributed computing is going. Like, are we going to see more and more machine learning models pushed out to the edge for application environments like what you're describing, where you've got multiple locations and you're collecting data, you know, and you have an ability that you have sensors uh, that are giving off data. Do you think that, you know, because it seemed like there was there was kind of this push towards get everything into the cloud. But, you know, I think people are finding that that's expensive, right? It's expensive to move everything to the cloud. If you can process things at the edge, you don't need all the data. You know, there, there may be some value there. What, what are your thoughts on that? I see. The, just a correction. In the, in the case of these uh, projects that I've mentioned, we still are in the cloud centric model. Yep. And we didn't need a lot of like computing power because it was none of these were really big data. Yeah. So they, they have like a huge amount of clients. I can speak to that detail later, but uh, they didn't require massive investments in the cloud to find those solutions. Yeah. But to your point, I do believe that's going to happen. And uh, my experience in these like over 20 years in the field, it's like waves. So we go to everything is centric, then everything is decentralized, and then we go back to everything centric and then it's it goes in the yin yang on and on yep. so right now we are surfing uh the wave of everything in the cloud uh and i do believe soon we're going to do a lot of computing on the edge so i think that is going to be the next wave for sure uh, especially because of the cheapest hardware that we have it's a major way to like save money from even big brands if we leverage the computing power that you have on an iPhone, for example. Right. It's, it's like incredible, the amount of computing power, unused, untapped computing power that you have in your hands. Yep. For example, I think the next like search engine that will like try to challenge Google, for example, very likely will leverage that. Because if you tackle that strategy, even a startup can have a large, very cheap computing power on day one to compete. You're saying if they can figure out a way to tap into that unused compute power that sits. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Super exactly. interesting. Super yeah, interesting. Yeah. For us at Working Co, depending on the project, there are projects that we just do the front end part. There are other projects that we do front end and integrations. And there are others like Gatorade GX, where you do the whole digital platform. On those cases that we're doing everything, we have a unique opportunity to balance and split the load and optimize the system end to end yeah. because we're controlling both ends. Yeah. Uh, but usually that doesn't happen because you're just touching a part of the system and due to Conway's law, the systems mimic the organization of the company. Yeah. You, you stumble across social historical barriers and it's harder to explore the uniqueness of the perfect balance of doing computing on the edge or computing on the cloud. Right, right. So, so you know, one of the things that's interesting, I think, 
right now is that we have so we have such an explosion of like high growth AI ML businesses, right? That um, they're coming out, they're building, you know, tech stacks uh, very quickly. You know, they're they're leveraging microservices, APIs, cloud computing, all of kind of the the most kind of cutting edge technology. Right. But then you have you know all of these kind of your traditional legacy enterprises that are you know running multi-billion dollar businesses across the world. And they have all this legacy infrastructure, they've got some technical debt, but they also have to make kind of a pathway to kind of machine learning and AI. And and so you it seems like you've seen both sides, right? What are what are some of the biggest challenges that large enterprises like a Gatorade, you know, what, what do you think are the, the biggest challenges that they face and, and how are they dealing with them from kind of what you're seeing in the field? I see. Just to contextualize my personal experience within Working Cool, because we are working usually for those big brands, Google, Apple, Gatorade, PepsiCo, yep. they are huge. They have huge data problems, but we are working on satellite sure. products for them. So usually we are not faced with the problem that you are speaking of in its entirety. Yep. So it's much simpler for us because we have somewhat control on the data acquisition and the data processing, almost in an isolated fashion. Got Sometimes it. we can drink from a data lake or, uh, you know, but usually that's not a reality for the kind of business that working co faces today because we are on the periphery of yeah. those digital problems that you were mentioning. Yeah. Uh, but we, we do have some like huge challenges, especially in terms of touching upon the data that we not we do not control. That is one of the challenges. The other one is the different thing I call digital inertia. So some companies have some digital inertia and they are not with a modern architecture, data pipelines, data infrastructure, or even best practice for data cleaning and data acquisition. So in those cases, the struggle to make them evolve to a level that will be compatible to the kind of service and quality that we're trying to offer, it's another challenge. So talk, talk about that challenge a little bit. How do you how do you help companies that are in that situation or, or what are your observations? Like what are the kind of recommendations that you all make? Right. So usually we, we try because our projects, depending on the relationship we have with the client, you have more penetration or not to influence at like the CDO level, CEO yeah. level, CTO, et cetera. There are other times that you're working for a specific group. And then the strategy is make it small and make it a success fast. And then you can you can expand. Yep. And as, as, as you expand, you, you get access, you build trust and things happen. So for the example, let's talk about fields, for example. In the case of fields, you could start with a more sophisticated, for example, machine learning, but we are building their digital platform from scratch. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to create the simplest possible solution that would cause the effects, the desired effect. And uh, even though we had like uh, deep learning and, and other very modern and powerful techniques, if you think about the carousel for products, so what are the top five products I'm going to put in your carousel? So for that, we explored an idea was, which was, let's understand the user first and classify the user as an explorer or what I called a monophagus. So we created this mathematical metric called the Explorer Index, which ranges from, if you always drink the same coffee, you are a monophagus. If you every time drink something different, you are an explorer oh, yeah. and everybody's in between. So of course we require machine learning for the fuzziness in the middle of that scale. But there is a lot of people that are very close to the extremes. And for the extreme monophagus, you just need to recommend the last coffee you purchase. That is an excellent recommendation system and incredibly cheap. And right. if you are an ex explorer, we can randomize products amongst the one you never try. That is a great recommendation, also extremely cheap to compute. And then we just invest the rest of the money for the people in between. So, and, and so these fallback strategies that don't go 
all the way to the fence. And it's, it's like Albert Einstein when they said, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. It's that mindset that we try to achieve because we need to minimize risks. It's, it's really different when I'm working for a branch within a big company that I have like a very comfortable schedule to do innovation and research. In our case, research is time bound, usually three months, six months, maybe a year. So it needs to be really fast and it needs to be robust. So we go from, we, we try the smartest dumb solution we can possibly implement. Got it. And, and for that recommender system, are you using kind of federated learning there to pick no, up? No, at the time we, we were not. Okay. Uh, I can only speak for 2018 and launch. Sure. And I, I cannot really speak how that platform evolved from that point on. The engagement with fields continue, but I moved to other projects. So it, I cannot tell you right now how that evolves. Got it. But at Got the it. time, I can tell you for sure that we're not doing it. Got it. So Although it would be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious just to hear from you. You know, the obviously the the world has kind of changed from when you started your career to kind of where we are today. You know, obviously there are things like you know computing power is is massively changed, and now there's this huge focus on on uh, machine learning and data science. How much has really changed? Because I, and I, the reason I ask you is I talked to somebody earlier today that, that basically said, look, the majority of the models and what we call machine learning today was all here 25 years ago. It's just math. Didn't, no. it was kind of a detractor. I'd like to get your your position that, on that. That is, a, that is a great question. I, I love that question. First of all, when we created the data science term, it was almost funny in a way because science was always based on data. There is no science based on anything else other than data. Uh, you can call the other thing magic <laughs> no, or, or anything else, but if it is science, it's based on data. Right. And most of what we have, or a, a big part, were statistical grounds. It's based on statistics. Uh, there's another part based on uh, uh, connection models of yep. sorts. And you have like these two lines, symbolic AI. and uh, But uh, so from that angle, the foundations are the same. The tooling is much better. The computing power is much better. Yeah. So uh, I think that change, like price uh, change, computing became cheap. My lamp has a chip that some people are playing Doom. They open up the lamp, they extract the chip, it becomes a video game. So you can see blog posts of people playing Doom in the chip in their lamp. So this is something that changed completely. Right. But the foundations are the same, right? The, the same principles, the, the perception <laughs> that is the foundation for all neural nets. We knew this from like the 70s or something. Yeah. So uh, the social problems are different because nowadays we need to, back then, you get a mathematician, you get an engineer. Now we're talking about a front-end engineer, a back-end engineer, a DevOps, a data engineer, a data science. But what is a data science? What is your background? Where did you came from? From the business, from the engineering, from the math part. So all of that taxonomy of roles, I think we're still kind of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, I think it's new, a little, it's newer. In terms, I remember when I uh, entered in the university, they were trying to define what a computer engineer was mm -hmm. because we had a computer scientist, which was pure computer science, but a computer engineer, what this person needs to learn. So in my undergraduate course, they put everything. And I think that's happening a little bit today with the data scientists of sorts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see it stratify the taxonomy, the branches will grow and we understand much better. Like we know, for example, in medicine, in medicine, we, we kind of have a very clear vision. What are the fields and subfields? Yeah. And I think that's going to happen as well for digital uh, echo space. So, so even if there is some marketing hype around this, um, would you say that um, the elevation of the data science role inside of organizations has given a, a great kind of opportunity for data scientists to speak more at the senior levels of business? For sure. I, th I think uh, we're not at the ideal place yet, but the hype helped. 
<laughs> yep. Because uh, everybody knew data was important. A lot of uh, business courses were using some of the techniques that uh, we teach today to data scientists, to data analysts. So using math was always important. But I think there are things such as uh, data quality, data acquisition, data automation. All of those things are, are getting a new level of recognition uh, from practitioners yeah. because of the hype from the data science, because there's more exposure, people are reading more, the education is better, and, and for sure there was an elevation of status in there. Okay. I agree. Okay. Now, um, you know, we have a lot of people on that listen to this program that are aspiring uh, data scientists, you know, looking to go sure. into careers. So, um, you know, what, what do you say to a, to a university student if they want to build a career in data science or if they just want to build a career, they love data, where would right. you point them? Like how, what, kind of, what kind of classes should they take and what kind of right. roles do you think are going to be really exciting in the future? I've heard that question asked like time and again <laughs> for many people. Uh, and I think each one of us have a different path. Yeah. So yeah. my personal path, I can speak for, about that path because it works for me. It doesn't need to be the same path, but yep. my path was starts with computing programming because I come from a time where the, the, the modern uh, like personal computers, like in the 80s, uh, they became a thing. We didn't even have many games at the time. So the fun was to program. So at the age of 13, my fun from computers was to write programs. That was yep. super exciting. Yep. And that led me to that path. And at some point, I started to dive into data science because I had a background in engineering because of the computer engineering path. And so I knew a lot of math. I knew a lot of physics, some chemistry. Uh, and uh, so I had the foundations there already. And I was attracted also to be that mathematical detective. So that's how I define my role at the time at EMC in that research center, trying to leverage projects for sales, uh, where this is like, this is the new project. What can you do? Your palette of colors is everything in math and computer science. Yep. Try to figure that puzzle out. So I felt like a detective, uh, for example, concrete example, we had to improve cross state transportation in Brazil, which is a big thing. People take buses and they, they, they go from state to state to buy sure. a bus because it's expensive. So yeah. you have these huge companies based on public transportation across states and they want to optimize. So how do you optimize their results based on their data? So you analyze the drivers, their behavior. You analyze the buses themselves, their performance. Mm -hmm. We even analyze the roads. So not only distance, but are, are these roads, this path very winding or like it's straightforward? Yeah. It's going up and down or it's plain. So we can use all of those clues. It's really detective work. You follow some clues and you solve the mystery. And then you have this like crystal ball that you're selling uh, like a gypsy say hey drink this read this on this crystal ball because for them like arthur clark said any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic so many of our clients were buying magic we were data shamans you know uh, but for us it was all explained there's no mystery it's it's the detective mindset and, right. and then studying became much more exciting because any new thing, you never know where you can apply something you have learned. Yeah. So all this story to go to the core of your question. So I think the key is be passionate. So the small success I achieved in my career, I think stands on the fact that I never really worked a day in my life because I was having fun all the time. Yeah. You know, it's something that I enjoy. I'm a learnaholic. I, you know, I have more books than I'm able to read them. I love it. Yeah. You know? So, so that kind of thing is the critical thing. And then it doesn't matter what path that person will take. They may go from business. They may go from engineering. They may go from like machine learning boot camps. 
You know, it doesn't matter if you're following a passion, if you feel connected, then it's going to happen for you. Okay. And okay. never stop studying. I, I love that. I love that advice. So we're, we're kind of close to the end of our, our talk here. I want to ask you one question that I think is uh, on the minds of many right now, which um, in, in the, we know we're in the, we're in the midst of kind of a pandemic here and, sure. you know, the environment is becoming a massive issue. We look at all these fires that are happening over the West and flooding in Germany. It's what crazy. kind of societal impacts do you believe AI, machine learning, AI, data science will have in the next decade? What are the big right. breakthroughs that you expect? Right. right. That, that is a great question because I once did a course, remote course in philosophy with uh, Professor John Searle. And one of the things that he mentioned was that there are three problems in philosophy. There is the problem of knowledge. There is the problem of ethics and the problem of governance. Mm -hmm. And in that order, they are harder. So the problem of knowledge, which wasn't solved yet, it's no things, how they work, where they come from, where, yep. you know, the problem of ethics, knowing, not having knowledge, what is right and what is wrong. And the problem of governance, having knowledge and having ethics decide what to do and how we govern ourselves. Yeah. And at that level, we are too focused on the problem of knowledge. And, and we are not that focused on the other levels. Yeah. So we're not investing enough energy into the problem of ethics. We're not an investing enough energy into the problem of governance that is even harder of all of them. Wow. So because of that, I'm happy because there's a lot to explore, but I'm also concerned because I think we're focusing on the wrong things. And who should take the lead in that? Is that governments that should take the leadership role in, in, in defining ethics and, and, and as, as always, or? as always needs to be a distributed effort. Collaborative effort, yeah. Yes, I think so. Because uh, if we just say governments should focus on that, governments have the tendency to corrupt themselves and, and fail, yep. right? So we need society to also think about it as a whole, each discipline has an opportunity to contribute. Uh, but the thing is, we need to go into schools at all levels, since like my four-year-old kids mm. up until like PhDs should be concerned about those issues. And I think in a way, AI is bringing that into the discussion as well. When we talk about self-driving cars, when we talk about human in the loop, uh, when you talk about ethics in yep. recommendation systems. So we have that notion, right? That uh, and in technology in general, the social dilemma movie that came recently. Sure, so sure. we're starting to wake up to focus on that discussion. It is super relevant. If you go back to, for example, Richard Stallman, which is a very controversial figure uh, uh, in general, I personally met him in a couple of visits in Brazil in in, in in conferences across the, the, the world, but he brought a very relevant point on the free software movement, right? Discussing is open source good enough or we need to consider free software as well. And I'm not advocating for free software or open source here, but I'm saying that discussion is super relevant, right? right? So that, that is my mindset. I love the perspective. So, so, but it sounds like if I can kind of paraphrase, you, you think that more innovation will be driven if we can get our minds around and, and make progress around those second, second two things, around ethics and governance. And the knowledge piece, not that we don't need it, obviously we need it, but that's where we spend most of our, so much emphasis is on today. It's easier, that's the thing. We tackle the knowledge problem because it is easier and it because it's super actionable. Right. Uh, right. Ethics is hard. We had few people that took had the courage to like go for the ethics problem and they caused major impact in society. Let's say Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Gandhi. Yeah. You know, they, they tackled the other, not the technology problem of their time, but the ethical problem. Yeah. That's like has a long life and everlasting impact in yeah. society. And yeah. I think just a last remark on this subject. If we go back to our origins 
Isaac Asimov, famous sci-fi writer, he was tackling ethical problems with the three laws of robotics. He was thinking about, he was not trying to build a robot, but he was telling what's going to happen when we have robots and how they interact with society and themselves. Yeah. So he knew back then that, 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 that was an important thing, you know? Right. So that's my last comment on the other topic. I love it. Okay. Well, listen, uh, Rodrigo, this has been super interesting and you've got so much to share with the community. If um, if folks want to reach out to you, is the best way to connect over uh, LinkedIn? LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, both both places they can go for Rod Samra, R-O-D-S-E, and as in Navy, R-A. And, and they can reach out and as soon as possible, I will give feedback. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Rodrigo, thank you again for, for your insights. And uh, we wish you all the best in, in, in continuing your career as well. It was a great pleasure, Matthew. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.